but out of duty to her. Compassion. <laughs> Holy shit! Earlier this week, I received an email from a games company calling itself a triple I publisher. Presumably the I standing for indie. Now, my dear viewer, if it was possible to reach through a computer monitor and slap an email round the back of its head, rest assured friends, I would have done that. Instead, I could only cry. Don't call your company a triple I publisher. I'm not going to tell you how to run your business, but don't chat shit. Triple I publisher? What? In a recent investor meeting, evil publisher Activision Blizzard confessed that Destiny 2 had failed to meet sales expectations, and that the shortfall would be made up for with further monetization for the product, alongside a faster delivery of content. As Activision COO Cody Johnson put it, we have not yet seen the full core re-engage in Destiny, which is just a cringeworthy way of speaking that only an executive could manage. Full core re-engage? Ugh. Anyway, the long and short of it is that Activision Blizzard had high hopes for Destiny 2 sales, and those hopes were not met. And yet, while this would appear to be bad news for Destiny 2, some sort of remarkable failure, it's not. Well, not specifically for Destiny 2, anyway. Because it seems that no matter how successful a game, no matter how many copies actually get sold, they almost always disappoint the publishers when shareholder meetings roll around. This problem goes back quite some time. Rather famously, in 2013, Square Enix expressed disappointment in the sales figures for three games that on the surface sold incredibly well. Sleeping Dog shifted roughly 1.75 million copies, Hitman Absolution managed 3.6 million, and Tomb Raider was at the time expected to sell around 3.4 million. And yet Square Enix said of all three games that they underperformed relative to expectations. By most metrics, all three games were pretty big hits, but the final story from the publisher was one of, well, failure. It's a distressingly common story that seems to occur regardless of how well a video game sells. Resident Evil 7 was both a critical and commercial success, selling over 4 million copies throughout its launch year, but compared to the ludicrous numbers Capcom expected, suggesting it would sell over 10 million copies throughout its overall lifetime, the title was performing well below the publisher's high, 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 high bar. Incidentally, Resident Evil 7 would go on to be Capcom's fifth best-selling game ever after it passed the 5.1 million mark, and yet, below expectations. You can plug almost any Capcom game released in recent years into Google, followed by below expectations and find a story. Marvel vs Capcom Infinite Sales fall below expectations. Resident Evil 6 and DMC below expectations. Monster Hunter Stories performed below expectations. It's a story endemic across the industry and from publishers in both the East and the West. From Electronic Arts, Dead Space 3 and Crisis 3 below expectations. Star Wars Battlefront 2 sales below expectations. From Ubisoft, Rayman Legends, Splinter Cell Blacklist, Below Expectations. The phrase below expectations has been a worryingly common one over the last console generation and this one, but rarely have we taken a step back to see just how clockwork-like it's become. Regardless of the sales figures, regardless of the acclaim, regardless of these games shifting copies in the millions, they are failures in the eyes of their publishers, and their answer to these failures are almost always the same as Activision Blizzard's, more monetization. One has to wonder exactly what publishers are telling their shareholders to so consistently fall short of the mark. We rarely get those expectations clearly communicated to us, the customers, but Capcom's 10 million lifetime sales for Resi 7 gives us a decent idea of the absurdity of what investors get told. And bear in mind, Resident Evil 7 did not sell as well as the dreadful Resident Evil 6, which also performed, you guessed it, 
below expectations. And at that time, not a single one of their games listed in their bestsellers ever was at 10 million. For fuck's sake. We also notoriously know that Electronic Arts needed Dead Space 3, a game in a series that should always have been treated as a niche horror product but wasn't, needed to sell 5 million copies at bare minimum to survive. EA was mocked for such a stupid expectation, and of course, Dead Space 3 failed to meet that objective. No matter the amount of actual money being scooped up by AAA games, anything short of explosive growth can be considered a failure, which is a problem affecting pretty much any company bound by capitalistic expectations. This year's Call of Duty cash cow, Black Ops 4, caused a drop in stock prices for Activision, as investors were reportedly disappointed that it only made $500 million in three days as compared to last year's card making $550 million. Yes, it's deranged, it's utterly, utterly fucked up, but that's business for you these days. If the arrows aren't going up at all times, you're in trouble even if you're making more money than anyone else in a fucking world. Over the years, people have tried to defend scummy AAA business decisions to me by saying, well, companies exist to make money, but here we're seeing the long-term damaging impact of that ethos, where no matter how much money you're making, it's never enough, and anything that isn't smashing the last record you're set causes you to hit the panic button with all of the guts of Fisto from Masters of the Universe. You know, because he's got a big metal hand. And it wasn't a very good not a very good analogy. As we've said on this show many times, and have only ever been proven right in saying it, publishers don't want to make money, they want to make all the money, every conceivable penny, every inconceivable penny now. All the money isn't even enough anymore. With these expectations that are never met, it seems publishers are now disappointed they're not making money that doesn't even fucking exist. Because what happens when you've finally made all the money? You cry because there are no more wallets to conquer. Hey Craig, Activision the Great. What do you reckon? Yeah, I know. I'm not calling them great. That's a metaphor, isn't it? Craig. Fucking idiot. The Black Ops 4 stock drop is a perfect example of the issue plaguing AAA video games as a business. You must always make more money than you did last time. Anything short of that, even if you're a blockbuster success, will make your shareholders do a sad squirty poo in their cum stained drawers. And thanks to microtransactions and similarly aggressive predatory monetization, a dizzying amount of money exploded into the coffers of publishers. We're talking billions here, with companies like EA making $1.68 billion off in game purchases alone, and Activision Blizzard accruing over half of its $7.16 billion revenue off of microtransactions. Major publishers have been enjoying a major boom period, which of course can only ever be followed by a bust, as the atmosphere-piercing levels of revenue are not levels that can be reasonably sustained forever, as we're already seeing with Black Ops 4, when you can't make more money than all the fucking money, your investors will start shitting their beds. This has to be why, even though the industry is making more cash than anyone could reasonably spend in a decade, publishers appear more desperate than ever for your cash, and feel compelled to, as Activision Blizzard is doing with Destiny 2, pump even more monetization into their games. This generation especially has seen games get carved up more and more and divided into multiple editions and additional content. In terms of standard game sales, not monetization, we've gone from companies just selling a regular game, to a regular game with a season pass, to a regular game with a season pass and deluxe edition, to a regular game with a season pass, a deluxe edition, and a deluxe edition, and a deluxe edition. It's now become commonplace for a game to sell three versions of itself, the regular edition, the silver edition, and the gold edition, with early access to a game being locked behind a pre-order for one of the more expensive editions. And with companies more ravenous than ever trying to keep that unsustainable growth a-going, I fully expect to see the equivalent of platinum editions added as a fourth standard tier in future. And all of this is on top of the physical crappy collector's editions that publishers still pump out full of plastic tat, and in Bethesda's case, a shitty nylon bag falsely advertised as a canvas. One. Right now, the so-called AAA game industry is a swan. On the surface, it's smooth sailing, elegantly gliding on top of record profits and revenue. Under the water, though, its legs are desperately kicking and flailing to stay afloat. Publishers have to keep promising more and more money for their investors, but customers are not an infinite resource, so when games inevitably fail, 
goal to meet expectations, the publishers must try and squeeze even more cash from the customers they already have. And eventually that will fail because the cash isn't an infinite resource either. And so more layoffs will happen, more costs cut, more value and content in games themselves reduced, while the games continue demanding more and more money for a complete experience. It's a mess. This is not a healthy industry. When we consider the special editions, the season passes, the microtransactions, the physical tat, the fast food sponsorship tie-ins, the DLC, when we consider publishers still behave as if they're just struggling to make enough money, so much so that they are currently fighting for the right to keep unregulated premium gambling mechanics in their games. When video games are treated like theme parks now, where you've got to pay for every aspect of the experience even after you've bought your ticket, you cannot convince me the AAA game industry isn't a seriously fucking broken thing. It's gone rotten, mate. It's gone completely and totally fucking rotten. A rotten swan still instinctively kicking itself across a stagnant pond full of dead fish and used condoms. Strauss Elnick notoriously called Grand Theft Auto Online the gift that keeps on giving as Take-Two Interactive fused the mainstream pop culture appeal of GTA to an online mode so laden with microtransactions. I'm surprised you don't have to pay to scratch your fucking ass in the game. The result was GTA 5 becoming the most profitable piece of entertainment in the history of entertainment, not just video games, and Take-Two Strauss Zelnick wasn't even satisfied with that, claiming they couldn't keep giving things away for free in perpetuity, as if a single second a player spends without also spending money is cash left on the table. Red Dead Redemption Online isn't even out of beta at the time of talking, but we can already see the fruits of Take-Two's greed. The game is a grind fest with something as simple as fast travel from your camp, unavailable until you reach rank 65, or otherwise purchased for 112 gold bars, which will be premium priced. It's suggested earning just one gold bar in game without real money will take around 8 fucking hours. And in my time playing it, yeah, that seems about right. More and more we're seeing games get grindier and grindier, less fun and less rewarding by design, in order to make the additional purchases appealing. As we've seen in movies with the desperately contrived cinematic universe craze that followed Marvel's success, DARK UNIVERSE! When one bit of entertainment succeeds, every company in the market will feel entitled to a piece of that pie. So it is, in the wake of GTA Online's mega success, live services have become the on vogue moneymaker. For now, till the well runs dry, then they'll move on. But for now, every publisher wants an online connected sprawl full of additional purchases. Ubisoft famously told its shareholders it was moving away from releasing proper video games, transitioning to a model where it can make more money off fewer products, and we've seen the results. The sheer volume of additional purchases both in and around Assassin's Creed Odyssey is intoxicating. Beyond Good and Evil 2 looks to be going the same way, the open world and online bullshit having nothing to do with the original game, but perfectly positioned to continue Ubi's live service contrivances. Even Bethesda, previously one of the last true third-party champions of AAA-level single-player games, has fallen for it for what is Fallout 76 if not a frantic, embarrassing attempt to capitalise on the live service trend. A totally conceptually lazy take on the idea to boot, Fallout 76 is a derelict open world of lacklustre content, which Bethesda hopes to profit on with microtransactions for garbage items that seem repurposed from Fallout 4. Because it doesn't matter if the game is actually any good, only that it's a live service. AAA video games, unlike Fallout's ever-present war, have most certainly changed, and not for the better. They've become worse, deliberately made less enjoyable so that publishers can falsify a sense of value when they charge more, either to sell content that used to be part of a standard product or to fix problems the publishers have purposely caused, such as grindy bullshit. And it's because they're desperate. They're like the bus in speed. If they slow down, they'll fucking explode. I love metaphors today, apparently. But it's true, making more money only increases the pressure to make more money and right now we're seeing that late stage capitalism at almost its worst. I fear saying it's at its absolute worst though because if there's one thing the AAA industry and big business in general has taught me by now it's that it can always get worse. Always. Until the stagnant pond swallows the swan hole and drowns the poor bastard for good. Now there are still some holdouts of quality AAA games that are not designed to extort your wallets, but they are becoming fewer and further between. Now earlier this year I argued the case for console exclusive games from first parties and there was some pushback to that because typically they are not great for the customer having to uh, get a game that's uh, 
tied exclusively to an expensive electronic, that's not brilliant on the surface, but I still maintain that because those companies, because platform holders are more concerned with selling the platform, they allow themselves to still make high quality, uh, decently invested AAA experiences. And this year, it should be no surprise that Sony's been knocking it out the park. Nintendo's been knocking it out the park. Microsoft, you know, these companies have been working hard to still make the kinds of games we used to be able to enjoy because they can afford to. So that's why uh, I still think that, that consoles have an important place in the game's market. And obviously we still have great indie games. Uh, personally, I would recommend The Missing uh, from Swery65. Uh, that's a fantastically brilliant game on a smaller scale. And we still do get those smaller scale games that are good. Uh, there you go, there's a little bit of positivity from me, from people who think that uh, I should be more balanced as if I'm a, 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 an American cable news station uh, masquerading as something fair. Uh, so there's a little bit of balance for you. Um, you know, everything isn't completely shit, but most of it is. Thank God for me.